is a licensed occupational therapist and is dedicated to occupational therapy and safety needs of agricultural producers and workers who have physical impairments and disabilities. She has approximately 20 years of practical experience as an occupational therapist in the physical rehabilitation issues and use of adaptive technologies needed by agriculture producers with conditions of aging, chronic health conditions, and disability. She is currently the co-project leader for New Mexico AgriBility and has been a key manager on two state agribility projects, Colorado for three years and in Oklahoma for four and a half years. She was instrumental in managing those programs into national prominence within the agribility field, as well as making several important contributions to the knowledge and skills of other agribility personnel and health professionals through numerous national presentations, workshops, and publications. Dr. Wilhite has been an invaluable resource for state projects throughout the US through consultation, design, advice, and providing assistance, as well as educating healthcare professionals and the physical rehabilitation issues of farmers. These activities have resulted in deep collegial relationships, trustworthiness, and collaboration with state agribility projects. She has conducted funded research into quality of life issues of farmers and ranchers with disabilities and tractor seeding for operators of paraplegia. She has also been in, on the advisory panel of the National Agribility Project at Purdue University. She has also completed a certificate in agriculture, occupational safety, and health training program for Iowa Center of Agricultural Safety and Health. And Dr. Wilhite is a main author of a resource guide called Agriculture for Life, a guide to health promotion, wellness, and work modifications for farmers and ranchers with disabilities. Now we welcome Dr. Carla Wilhite. Thank you. I uh, appreciate being here. I always do. And uh, I just uh, see a lot of folks in this room that I know and respect so much. <clears throat> and I'm always get excited at the idea that we'll get together again in real life. Excuse me, your, your throat always gets dry right before you start talking. <coughs> okay, so let me go ahead and screen share and I'll pull up my PowerPoint for today. And hopefully everybody can see that. So uh, as Tani said, we're going to talk about, we're going to dip our toes in, our big toes into talking about finding the right aftermarket tractor seat cushion. And um, actually, it's probably not really tractor seat cushions, but cushions that we can put on tractor seats. Um, all right. <coughs> I apologize. So um, just to describe the session today, we're often asked to by our agribility customers to provide advice, you know, like when we're selecting aftermarket cushions um, and we like to, for them to be comfortable, we want them to feel supported and we especially want their skin to be protected on the tractor seat. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're, we're going to go into a little more depth about that. Um, we need to know that, you know, different users, um, there's just not a one size fits all solution. So finding the right cushion can kind of be difficult, especially when most of us are not running around with a pressure mapping system. <coughs> and there's very little research on the subject. So hopefully this session will help us think more about situations um, where some general cushions can be the solution. And also when we want to consult with seating specialists and at least seating specialists are somebody that we can find because <coughs> I would imagine almost every state has a wheelchair seating specialist that you could consult with in uh, making the right accommodations for people with like spinal cord injuries or really severe back injuries. Hey Carla, can I interrupt just a second? Um, yes. I think if you click on, on your screen with the three dots, it will probably show the screen a little bit bigger and just show the one that you're on, if you don't mind. 
So click the three dots and. And then cho it chooses to hide the presenter's view. Oh, hide the presenter's view. Huh, it is not saying that. There should be, Paul, do you want to chime in here? Carlos, just, what we did earlier, remember when it was in presenter view and you went in and in, it said switch to? Yes. Yeah, it's back to presenter view again. Ha. Huh. So I think the three dots at the bottom underneath your slide. There you go. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, thank you guys, because to me it looks normal. All right, so what I've put up here are photos from a, an old uh, resource that uh, documented all the 90th and 50th and one percentiles of the shapes of men and women. And uh, what I want you to, to take away from these photographs of those, of, of those book pages is just how many different measurements there are to a human being. We're never going to memorize that. Uh, you know, back in the 1970s, uh, the average uh, male was 172 pounds. Uh, and the average weight of a female was 137. And I doubt that that even holds true today. But one of the things that we have to, to take into consideration are people's ages. You know, people who are different ages will have different body shapes, uh, different deposition of things like fat on their bodies. Um, <clears throat> we were talking about, um, the way that uh, cowboys look in their Wranglers when they're young looks a lot different than how they look in their Wranglers when they're 70. Um, and uh, often, you know, men in particular tend to have, you know, kind of bony butts as they get older and they move their belly around, they move their butt around where their belly is. Um, gender is an issue, you know, as you can see from the the difference between the, the male and the female body shape. You know, women have wider hay sizes and even people's weight is an issue. Um, people may be very thin and bony. People may be very uh, large and have huge, you know, deposition of fat on their bodies. And all of these things make a difference. And then on top of that, <clears throat> you put things like physical condition, you know, is the person in excellent health? Is the person in good health? Um, and then you add on top of that health conditions that affect the whole musculoskeletal system and the whole organ systems of people. And then yes, even ethnicity, there are differences in the body shapes and sizes of people who are, are uh, different by ethnicity. So that's a whole bunch of things that we sort of have to unpack with each and every one of our clients is to just take a really good frank look at them and uh, just kind of describe them. The other thing that I would point out too is is posture and I probably should have put put that on the, the list. But if you've heard me you know talk before over the years, I, I have talked about posture in terms of uh, the, the skeletal system. And I've, I've got a slide that I'll show you where we'll talk about that in a little more depth. So this is um, a screenshot from that same uh, text. And it gives you the third, the 90 percentile male. And this individual is actually seated in a tractor environment 
And so uh, what I want you to uh, take away from this photo is that every square inch of that operator station is designed. Every push pull, every reach, everything that we grip, every knob, you know, every surface, everything is a variable, you know, and when I say a variable, it means something that can be changed. So if we, you know, Dr. Field could give us, you know, the master class on the operator station of a tractor. Um, but the takeaway here is if we change one variable, just one, you know, we may have unintended consequences. So we have to take that approach with just adding anything to the tractor. We have to use some common sense and we have to have just a bit of understanding about some of the dynamics that are happening in the tractor environment. And we're not, by and large, as agribility specialists, we're not tractor seeding experts, unless we are, you know, unless you are Dr. Field. Um, so as you lo look at this photo, again, just kind of appreciate that, that if we change the height of the seat by putting another cushion on there, what else have we changed? Well, we've changed the angle of the knee. We've changed the angle of the knee to the foot, to the ankle. We've changed the distance of the reach to the steering column. You know, we've changed how the back interacts with the, the backrest. And we've also changed that person's horizontal sight line. So when we make changes, we have to keep these things in mind that we may be making more than just one adjustment in order to fit the tractor environment to the person. All right. <clears throat> so just kind of reviewing the kind of things that tractor operators do. Um, they're not just sitting, you know, motionlessly in the seat unless they've you know, got an autonomous uh, driving tractor, but uh, they're doing steering, they're operating different level levers, they're operating different buttons, switches, uh, they're applying brakes and clutching the tractor, they're often, you know, looking behind to, to watch the towing uh, implement or a toolbar. Uh, they're maneuvering the machine across different kinds of surfaces. And they're doing all of this from a seated posture. And that seated posture and all of the forces acting on the tractor that are getting transmitted to that person's body, it's creating a pattern of loading on the body and particularly on the joints of the operator. So you putting in long hours in the tractor um, and this is an accumulation. This isn't, isn't a one-time event. You can accumulate all of this trauma from long hours in the tractor. From the time you start being a tractor operator to the time that you're in your middle age, you're, you're, you're working away joint surface you're gonna wind up with back pathologies and even especially in the interface between the, the, the seated person, nerve and vascular issues. Uh, and th this information came out of a fairly recent article by Romano. So just going in a little more depth about uh, Romano uh, et al. 2019 article, um, they tested three tractor seats and they kind of characterized them as being a low cost tractor seat situation. And this tractor just had you know, mechanical suspension 
and just a regular, you know, foam seat and back. Uh, I don't think it even had armrests. Then they went to a medium cost tractor seat, which they described as having pneumatic uh, suspension. So just having a little air cylinder in there that kind of gives you a little more um, attenuation of vibration. And then they had a high cost tractor seat uh, where it had auto adjusted pneumatic. So just think in terms of uh, what we would usually call uh, air suspension. Um, and uh, they tested the tractors in three different conditions. They all went through some plowing operations. They all did some harrowing uh, and haying. And the sample was eight healthy males of average size. Um, and they looked at variables of the highest maximum pressure and average pressure using pressure mapping uh, between the person's bottom and the seat interface. And of course, whatever uh, pant material that the person was wearing. And I think what was interesting to me were their findings. They found that the pressure distribution between the body and the seat and posture are the main things that led to the discomfort of those eight subjects not the vibration or the seat geometry, meaning the, the, the seat design. Um, and I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, we could have probably intuited this, but the low cost seat performed the worst and the high cost seat performed the best. I noted though, you know, just based on, on the previous work that I've done on, on seating for uh, farmers with spinal cord injuries, is that the peak pressures that they were recording were still really high and would have caused a disruption to the oxygen perfusion of the person's bottom. And that's what's going to lead you to the, the vascular and, and nerve issues that happen as an accumulation of injury. Uh, and then the next example I'll show you, and this is unpublished data from three subjects that myself and my students um, uh, performed. Uh, this was IRB approved research. We uh, found some a, a convenient sample of three male subjects from the same family. They were 40, 42, and 70 years of age. Um, we used the same tractor, it was a family tractor, it was a New Holland uh, T5070 with a max horsepower of 120. Um, none of the subjects had any uh, major health conditions uh, and we had the tractor driven on both pavement and off-road in a pretty rugged pasture. And I looked at some different seating conditions, just the contour seat, the one that just comes with the tractor. And I would add that in this tractor, um, we had mechanical suspension. And so this, this actual tractor represented kind of the, the low cost tractor seating option um, that Romano had in his study. And we also looked at a gel foam cushion and then three air cushions. Uh, the Rojo cushions, which are kind of considered the gold standard cushion for people with spinal cord injuries, uh, but they have a lot of cons and some pros, but a lot of cons for them being in the tractor environment. And we'll talk about that later. And we used the X sensor pressure map system. And the procedures that we did, we, um, we, 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 uh, took height, weight of each of our subjects. Um, I did a postural assessment on them. Uh, we looked at health conditions. Like I said, there weren't, there weren't very many, or if any, except that our age 70 farmer, he had 
one of those really bony butts. He was pretty, pretty slender individual. And that becomes important here in a, in a few minutes. Um, but what we did, we would um, uh, randomize the order of the cushions uh, for each person. Um, and we would have the person sit on the cushion uh, with the foam cushions and the gel cushions and just the seat. We would have them sit on the seat for about 15 minutes so that they would settle into the seat cushion material and onto the pressure map. And then we'd have them do a quick kind of pressure relief and then have them sit back down so that we could get the truest picture of what their uh, seating confirmation looked like on that pressure map. Um, and then we would have them operate the tractor uh, for, for 10 minutes and then they stopped. We'd do another pressure relief and then we'd um, have them sit back down. So it was really important. It, it was pretty time consuming, but it was really important to uh, reach under their butts, so getting pretty personal with them, and find where each ischial tuberosity was on the map. So I would reach under their butt, uh, find the IT, press down, and kind of leave that data artifact on the pressure map picture, uh, which was recording all the events. So that was kind of the procedures that we ran. And then um, I just want, for an example, this was uh, the 42 year old male. And on the left side, you see just the tractor seat as is. What I love about this picture is uh, you can actually see the seat design. Um, there's kind of four big pads on the uh, tractor seat and you can actually see all four of those pads on this artifact of the map. But one of the things I want to bring to your attention is just, let me see if I can just draw. I might need to choose a different color, but maybe you can see my pencil going around. This is the, the right ischial tuberosity of subject three. And you see that red color? That's the peak pressure, you know, and on our map legend on the right, that's 209 millimeters mercury. Well, we cut off the oxygen supply to tissue at 32 millimeters mercury. So do we think that that might be a problem? Um, our bodies tell us when we need to move. And so, you know, maybe five minutes later, uh, subject three is gonna lean a little more to the right because that oxygen, that tissue is starving for oxygen and it's signaling the body, dang, you need to move. I'm getting tired. I'm not comfortable, you know, and we just automatically and unconsciously make that adjustment. And that's great for people that who have sensation intact. Um, but, you know, hours and hours of sitting like this, moving back and forth from one cheek to the other and one cheek to the other. I mean, it's fatiguing and it's damaging. Now, <clears throat> on the right, uh, here he is on just a gel foam cushion. It was just one more inch of cushioning and see the difference that we've made. We've dropped out, I'm seeing like maybe 180 peak pressure under his right IT now. And we can see that there's just a little more what we call envelopment into the cushion material. It's like we got more square inches on the seat than we did on the, on the left. So that's a pretty dramatic difference. 
does it go far enough as an intervention? You know, that's probably a question. I mean, he has an intact sensation. We know we've made him more comfortable, uh, but we're still seeing some pretty high pressure issues. So maybe we want to put him into something different. But again, um, we'll talk about how, how we, we can kind of rule of thumb, maybe figure out what material is best since we don't have pressure maps. But, um, oh, I have to turn off the annotation. Okay, so here are all the cushions for subject one. This is our uh, age 70 individual. And at the, the top, let me pick a, at the top, we, we see this is just the, the, the tractor seat itself. All right. And, oh, actually, I'm sorry. This is just the tractor seat itself. And so this is my 70 year old with the really bony butt. And I have to tell you just from memory, his butt looked like this almost all the way through the trial. So that was kind of discouraging. Um, and he, you know, he even commented that he wasn't really comfortable in the tractor. Um, here we've got him on just a, a regular cheap piece of foam and we see a little bit of improvement. Um, and then we see him on just a one inch thick low profile air cushion. And voila, look, we've gotten rid of all of the yellow, red, orange data. And we've got a lot of square inches of uh, immersion into the seat cushion. So I, I'm liking what I see. And it seems like, well, more is even better. So let's put him on the two inch high uh, Rojo. Well, wow, there's a problem here. Uh, we see a, a red uh, spot up here. And we also see this kind of strange seam up here. And you know, what it comes down to is we have probably overinflated this cushion and making it a much firmer seat condition. Uh, and then put them on the four inch Rojo and we've actually probably overinflated this seat as well. So that just just gives you an idea is more is, but in this case, the low profile Rojo cushion really looked best for this 70 year old person. Tani, any questions yet in the chat? Um, no, we don't have any questions yet. All right. Okay, I want to undo all these. Clear, clear all my drawings. Okay. So let's talk some turkey. There are about four main cushion types for us to choose from. And one is just a kind of a cheapy foam cushion. Uh, one is what we consider a, a liquid gel. One is possible choice choice is the air cushion and one have their pros and cons so let's look at the foam cushion well the great thing about foam is it's fairly cheap unless you're a seamstress, you know, when you go to Joann's or Hancock's fabric and you want to buy a, a piece of foam insert that you always go when the foam is on sale because it's so expensive. Um, 
But in any case, foam compared to the other materials is pretty inexpensive and it is comfortable. Um, but the con is it gets out of shape pretty quickly. You know, it just flattens out. And, you know, because of that, we would never recommend it for heavy, heavy use, you know, and, and uh, also wouldn't re re recommend it for long term use. So, you know, if, if you have uh, no limit to your budget, you know, just keep buying new inexpensive foam cushions um, at about 25 bucks a pop for the rest of your life. Um, but again, you know, it's a great material. It, it's uh, relatively stays the same, whether it's hot or cold or, or in between. And then uh, there's a gel cushions. And in this picture, we can actually see, I, I liked the picture uh, because you could see the contrast between, this has like a, a one inch of just normal foam sitting on top of that blue gel that's uh, contained within, you know, kind of a, a, a plastic um, envelope. And uh, automatically you can see, man, that stuff is just gonna really let your butt sink down into it. You get really good immersion into the seat cushion and that's going to increase your comfort. Um, so again, these are made, you add a gel patch, pouch just on top of a base of foam. So it's comfortable, you get good immersion. The con is that gel is really heavy and it can get punctured and it can leak some sticky gook everywhere. And if you leave it in the tractor, it's gonna freeze and be like a rock when you put your butt on it. So you would probably have to just constantly put it in, take it out, put it in, take it out. Um, kinda gets a little more expensive a basic gel cushion from a medical supply shop cost you anywhere from maybe 900 to 200 for better quality of gel cushion. So that's another option. Um, then you have the air cushion and some of the pro to the air cushion, there, there's some great ones. Uh, they offer the most immersion, they offer a great comfort and they give us great re, uh, redistribution of the person's seated pressure. Um, the con is air is the only thing you have in there. So if it goes flat, the person sitting on the harder surface underneath. Um, they also don't feel as stable as other cushions. Uh, people that use them say that they, they feel like they're just kind of floating around. Um, and so we might not want to recommend it for somebody that moves around a lot, like in a tractor you know, where they're getting bounced around. And leaking is also a possibility in this kind of cushion. And then, you know, the other downside to it is they really, that rubber deteriorates under UV light. So if you wanted to maintain your $500 investment in a Rojo cushion, you'd want to take it in and out with you every time you get in or out of the tractor. Um, Rojo also makes a, a cheaper uh, air cushion that's called the Airhawk. And I, I know that many of you are familiar with the Airhawk and it's only about a $99 uh, cushion. It doesn't have all the, the bells and whistles as a, a Rojo, but um, it might be the right solution for a person if they're able to maintain it and also figure out where their sweet spot is in how much residual air is in the cushion. Um, the, the, the hard thing is, is, you know, you have to be able to reach underneath 
and subjectively determine that you've got just one inch of air under each IT, under each ischial tuberosity. Um, a lot of people that can do that for themselves, um, but that, that doesn't seem as uh, precise to me as if we had a, a pressure gauge that we could put onto the air stem um, that, that we can see in this picture. I would feel a lot better if we had a gadget that could measure the PSI that remains in this cushion, because if we, we knew that it was about, I think it's a six PSI pounds per square inch, that that would be just about where the sweet spot is, at least according to some research coming out of uh, Georgia Tech. Carla, we had a question comment about this as well. They said, wouldn't the temperature also be changing factor in the support given by this site pressure? Absolutely, temperature, right? I mean, molecules expand in heat, so that can make the, the, the cushion feel uh, overheated as it gets hotter and, you know, likewise as it gets colder. The other issue is changes in elevation. You know, we do have some uh, ranchers and farmers in the Rocky Mountain region that are changing elevation and, you know, with altitude, we'll see a change in this cushion. So, you know, one of the cons to it is you probably are in a situation where you frequently have to monitor the conditions of your cushion. Uh, and who's going to do that? I mean, I'm not going to do that. I just want to get in, sit down, and go about my business. Um, and, and so you can see that if we have an overinflated cushion, it, it's increasing you know, pressure on the butt that, that might not be acceptable. So even though the air cushion is kind of the gold standard, and you know, I've, uh, we've often said, you know, throw a rojo on it, I mean, it, it's, it's if we, if we decide to use the air cushion, we really need to know that this is an individual that can take responsibility for monitoring this cushion and taking care of this cushion to get the most benefit out of it. So thank you for that question. So then we have a, another material called urethane honeycomb. And it, it almost felt, feels kind of like uh, those shoes that were really po popular with little girls not too long back called the jellies. Um, this is a, a, a cushion that uh, distributes the weight of the body pretty well. It is comfortable. It lasts longer than regular foam. Uh, the, one of the other nice things about it is you've got the increased airflow be, because you've got, you know, the little honeycombs and it's pretty shock absorbent and lightweight, you know, unlike the gel. But, you know, another con is it's also going to need replacement with, you know, heavy use because it is a type of urethane foam, even though it's a, a more of a closed cell type of foam. Let me turn that annotation off. All right. Um, but that said, um, it, it, it could be one of our good choices because you can find it as cheap as $59. Uh, this one's actually a picture of the one that is made by purple. You know, and if you don't know purple, it's like the rage in terms of uh, foam for beds uh, right now. Uh, and also you can find uh, different kinds of honeycomb you know, up in the $250 to $300 range. Um, but uh, I think that it could be well worth the investment um, since it, it's comfortable and it, and it lasts longer than, than regular foam. All right. So 
my rule of thumb kind of recommended process for selecting cushions would be that it's safe to assume that low cost tractor seats are inefficient at redistributing seated pressure for people with neck or back pain, arthritis, sensory issues, muscle pain. So things like fibromyalgia, right? So uh, a lot of our um, clients are using low cost tractor seats. So I think it, it just should be kind of automatic to, to look at the seat cushion. Um, I would always consider upgrading from mechanical suspension to pneumatic air or even auto air. Uh, and I would be, you know, checking with my go-to with K&M machinery to, to see if they make an upgrade kit for uh, the tractor that I'm looking at. Um, and then I would consider the additional low profile cushion to put on top. And what I want to do though, is I want to try to put this decision into the hands of the tra tractor operator. So I'm gonna discuss the pros and cons of all the different cushioning materials with them. And then I want to see if I can have them test drive cushions for one to two hours. So one thing, you know, as agribility specialists, you might want to do is just have kind of a, uh, a go-to low cost kit, you know, for, for maybe a few hundred dollars of just a regular foam, uh, a, a gel, uh, maybe the air hawk, and also um, a honeycomb gel, uh, a honeycomb cushion. And, you know, let the tra tractor drive those out, try those out. And you're gonna just, you're gonna eliminate the uncomfortable cushions until they arrive at their best choice. You know, and again, we're, we're doing this kind of low tech procedure because we don't have the convenience of having pressure mapping with us all the time, even though that would be great. So this is kind of how I go about the process now. And then when it's time to call in the professionals. So this picture is of an individual who has a pretty severe kyphosis, you know, on the right. Uh, we see a lot of our farmers and ranchers with this posture, maybe not as severe, but just kind of that head forward. And it's from a lifetime of working hard. <clears throat> and the spine has just, you know, began to curve forward. And then uh, the torso on the left, you know, shows that not only can we bend forward, we can bend from one side to the other, uh, where maybe we're putting more weight, this individual is putting more weight on their right cheek than they are their left when they're sitting down. And if I could put my hands on the pelvis, I could even feel if there was a torsion on this column and see if one hip is further forward than the other hip. So then we have not only a bend and a side bend, we also have a rotation. So that would be a pretty significant skeletal deformity. And we can usually look at people and see these uh, especially the more we observe people. So when I want uh, us to call professionals is when we're dealing with spinal cord injuries, when we're dealing with people who have had complex neck, back or spinal surgeries, uh, people with major skeletal deformities, uh, people with poor postural control, and definitely folks who have lost sensation in their butt or their genital urinary area. So down there where um, uh, the really thin skins of the perineum are. <clears throat> so just to summarize, and we'll, we've got a little time for discussion. There is no one size fits all solution. Uh, we have to be able to anticipate changes in variables and that they can have consequences for other parts of the operation system 
that we might have to also accommodate. Um, low cost tractor seats suck. I'm just gonna say that um, and may indicate the need for seating interventions for our elderly operators or operators with health conditions. Just remember there's four basic kinds of cushions. They each have their pros and cons. Uh, try each type to find the best fit for comfort and call in the professionals, a wheelchair seating specialist when the case is complex. And I thank you and we've got some time for discussion. We do have a question. Um, Pauline asks if do you also discuss more frequent upload unloading, especially with the rotation loads often while working with implement and behind or implement on behind. <clears throat> Let me look at that question. This, this is this is Pauline. I'll just okay. clarify it. Um, I, and I realized that uh, as a fellow OT, I probably look at this a little bit differently. But um, in, in the case where someone is helping choose a cushion, um, I, I, do they also have an opportunity to talk about um, doing your own pressure releases more frequently? Because I think when you're so engaged in the task that that sometimes that doesn't happen as frequently as it should, and it may not even be an awareness that it should be happening. I mean, I think about it in terms of just, you know, my own self sitting on my Herman Miller chair right now. Uh, I'll sit in this chair for hours, and when I get up, I can hardly move because I'm 62 years old. So yeah, I, I, Pauline, I, I definitely agree with that. We need to have uh, not only the discussion about the seating surface, but the need to take breaks and the need to offset pressure. I mean, our, if we have intact, right? If we have intact sensation, our body tells us to move, but that still doesn't mean that we can't override that through our volition to say, well, I've just got one more hour, you know? But so we do, we do need to, to be better at taking care of our bodies and, and that educational part is huge. Good question. More questions or comments, because I know that a lot of you are working out in the field and you're seeing these situations. Well, I had a question. How often do you recommend someone upgrade or replace their seat? It really is going to depend on how hard they are on it uh, versus how well they take care of it and also just the physical properties. We all know um, we buy a brand new pillow at you know, Bed Bath & Beyond and you know, even the expensive one. And uh, we take it home, we sleep on it, it's great. But you know, after several months, it's not. I mean, I have like this $100 foam pillow that I'm using now, memory foam, right? That's supposed to be good for your neck. Well, it isn't now. So, and I've only had it for a year. So it's really gonna depend, yeah, on use. And that's part of that conversation that you have with the person is look at the cushion, you know, is it dented? You know, does it have, uh, uh, look like your, your, your butt and it's gotten thinner, then it's, it's time to change the cushion. Uh, if it's starting to fall apart, it's time to change the cushion. If it's got a hole in it and you know, you've patched it, it's still leaking, it's time to get a new cushion. And that's a good reminder as we go out and visit some of the farm sites and they may not ask us specifically about their tractor seat, but that would be definitely something to to ask to take a look at, especially if they've had joint replacement or some other type of, you know, skeletal change. Yeah, and, and as we know from the agribility um, demographic data, despite whatever else is going on with our clients, a lot of them have back pain and a lot of them have arthritis. So I would just make it pro forma, no matter what they their presenting issue is, is to just take a peek 
at the tractor seat. When you were so, doing your research, <clears throat> this is Ned Stoller. Hey, Ned. When you were doing your research with the three men on the Ford tractor, uh, the bouncing around on rough terrain makes a person end up maybe scooching around and being on different parts of the cushion at different times. Did your pressure mapping show like impact points where that was happening? And what concern do we have if we have maybe a cushion that's shaped just right for somebody, but then they bounce over to the side or aren't sitting on it quite right? Well, you know, um, I think in, in some, and, and yes, we did see the artifacts of that in the data. Uh, you would, uh, as I, I watching the, the linear graph uh, of the, the pressure map, you could see every time they hit a rock or, or hit a bump or whatever, you know, the, 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 the pressure would spike and uh, you would see maybe a little bit of offset of the body from one side to the other. But I would have to say that it, it wouldn't, if they were well immersed into the surface, uh, I didn't see as much of the lateral movement of the butt on the seat as I did with just the contour cushion, you know, the tractor seat that was in there. Uh, but, you know, if, if you've got them on an over, over inflated Rojo cushion, I mean, I'm sure it's like a rodeo. So again, that's why we, we, uh, we kind of have to go through the, the, the trying it out to, to, to actually get that feedback from the user of what they feel is going on. But I think that the more immersion that we get into that surface, especially like what I saw on the gel and foam cushions. Uh, I liked what I saw. And this is Pauline again, and, and along those lines, and I, I'm not as familiar with as many kinds of the, the new tractors because I'm not on the farm anymore, but um, you know, sometimes the idea of we'll make a comfortable chair is just like what they do with office chairs. And it may, and they, so they may try and build up one poor part or round another part or that kind of thing. And, and especially in a case like that, it may be wonderful when you're sitting very still for a certain amount of time, but I, I would suggest that probably that kind of, of trying to find the just right points to foam build up would not be as usable um, on machinery where you're having to move a lot and you're being moved. Um, but, but that's just my thoughts. Well, uh, to that end, um, I mean, we, we could think in terms of um, what happens when um, wheelchair seating specialists are trying to fit custom inserts into a seat and they are pressure mapping and they are 3D mapping the actual posture of an individual. So if they went about their job unconsciously, they would just make that seat insert custom fit to that person's body and that person's body would be absolutely locked into place and they would never be able to move. Um, and uh, you know, the earliest uh, iterations of custom seats, that's probably what happened. And now when they throw somebody onto uh, a custom seating uh, situation and they're, they're making it really conforming, they actually have the person wiggle around, you know, so that you're creating more degrees of freedom for movement to happen. Um, and so with a regular cushion where I'm getting pretty good immersion, it's not really locking my pelvis into place. Uh, I still have some accommodating room around my butt 
So I'm not as worried as I would be if I if it was a custom anatomical fit. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes a lot of sense. So none of those cushions are, are going to lock somebody's pelvis into place. Uh, unless maybe they've got really low uh, tone and uh, postural issues and and then they're going to meet that condition where we want to bring in a, a, a specialist. Have you ever used uh, like on wheelchairs, they can put side wings to help somebody with their posture to stay sitting up straight. Have you ever seen anything like that on a tractor? I have not. The closest I've seen is like a racing car seat that kind of has a back that comes out on the sides a little bit. And I've seen all kinds of different uh, homemade straps uh, to try and help keep the person on the seat. But I mean, it, it just begs the point, Ned, that, that there's so much research that really needs to be done for us to be able to identify great solutions for our, uh, especially uh, farmers and ranchers with spinal cord injuries, um, but even just those farmers and ranchers that I work that we work with with arthritis and back issues and stuff like that are probably not getting what they need out of those low cost tractor seats. It's so tempting to just buy the $89 tractor seat at TSC though. It looks so much better than what's on there, you know, all those cushions off and sitting on boards and everything. I have seen the sitting on boards and the rat nest, you know, foam and stuff like that. So uh, if, if that's the only thing in their budget, I mean, that is a minor um, improvement. I'm not sure if it's a significant improvement, but I think to the extent if we can can check with uh, k and or, or other uh, folks like them to see what upgrades are possible, uh, the if we can just get them into something better than what they've got, it's probably a good deed done. And, you know, barring that, you know, improvement of the suspension or you know, improvement in a standard uh, or, or an available commercial seat for, for the tractor, then adding an aftermarket cushion of some kind is probably, um, at least improving the situation somewhat. So I just want to take a moment and remind everyone that there is the evaluation survey in the chat, if you'd please complete that and Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Carla. Um, I don't know if we'll have any other questions. I wanted to go ahead and go over this last slide that we have so everyone I'll, knows. Tony, I'll, I'll, ha I'll hang around for a few minutes after if, if people want to ask questions. OK, take it away. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. So recording of this session, along with the slides, will be archived on the National Agribility website at www.agribility.org slash online training slash 2021 NTW virtual slash. And you can use the same Zoom link that used today for all of our upcoming Tuesday sessions. And next week's session is Low Tech Assistive Technology at Home and Abroad with Ned Stoller from Michigan Agribility and Peter or he from Embrace Farm in Ireland at 1 p.m. Eastern time. If you have any questions, you can contact Tess at tmckeel at goodwillfingerlakes.org. So Carla, hang on a little bit if anybody has any questions. I want to be respectful of her time as well. Absolutely. 
Thank you, Tawny, for moderating. And thank you, Carla, for presenting. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, sometimes I'm actually on time with stuff, but I was definitely not this time. Oh, it was fine. I don't know if you're reading the comments, Carla, but a lot of thank yous and compliments about your presentation. Oh, good. Okay. Oh, thanks for stopping the screen share. <laughs> 